Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today with Parents Know Best Education Initiative at FreedomWorks. Today, we are going to discuss a powerful option, and that is the option of vocational, technical, or VOTEC schools. So joining me today to discuss that are two experts in this arena. Jamie Gass of the Pioneer Institute's director of the Center for School Reform, and David Ferrara, a co-editor of Pioneer's new book, Hands-On Achievement, Massachusetts National Model Vocational Technical Schools. I knew very little about Votech schools, except for what I could remember when I was in public school, and that was a while ago. And so I'm very excited as well to learn what is new in this space. And I, my understanding is there's a lot of new things um, that could be great for a population, you know, a certain percentage of students where this fits them better than a traditional high school experience, if you will, and beyond. So uh, just to give you background on Pioneer Institute briefly, it's a think tank that develops ideas that advance the prosperity and vibrant civic life in Massachusetts and beyond. I love that. A strong conservative think tank, although they might not call themselves conservative, I imagine that they are for freedom, the freedoms that we all hold dear in America. And you all produce research and you act as a resource for legislators on Beacon Hill and for staff in the state's executive offices. So thank you for all you do. And welcome to both of you. Thank you. So, Thanks so much. yes, absolutely. So I want to go to um, to Jamie first and, and David jump in at the end if you'd like to comment as well. But most of us think of Votech as the industrial schools founded primarily to supply workers to factories and shops. And then there were the auto mechanics, plumbers, electricians, machinists, farmers, hairdressers, cooks, and homemakers, all wonderful and worthy um, places to go with your career. Our daughter is a very successful hairstylist, so we love uh, these options uh, for young people and for people that are wanting a career change, frankly. So we think of it in those terms, but the Massachusetts Education Reform Act of 1993, I understand, has kind of changed that view. So help us understand that change. We'll go, uh, either one of you can jump in and we can hear from both of you on this. Sure, so first of all, I wanna thank you, Tamara, and Freedom Works for all the great work that you folks do, and we're really uh, happy to participate in this and sort of share the story here in Massachusetts. So. Uh, back in 1993, we had a bipartisan ed reform law that essentially put additional funding into the system for a lot of accountability, high academic standards, and some enhanced choice. And I really think and believe that federalism matters is, and that states have to pursue the reforms that are going to fit best for them. But I do think that there's some lessons here. And the biggest lesson may be in terms of the performance of the Vogue Tech schools. It really is a remarkable story in an environment which, in truth, there's not a lot of great stories in mm -hmm. K-12 education reform in this country. It's a pretty bleak picture. The NAEP data that just came out recently was horrendous, not just because of the pandemic, but there's been academic decline that's been going on for decades, and it's really kind of uh, come to, to light uh, with the recent NAEP data. But the thing that's really great about these Vogue Tech schools, and, and I think you're right, that there was a kind of conception that people had of Vogue Tech schools for many years, but the Vogue Tech model here, coupled with the high quality academic standards and accountability through a high stakes test and the school choice has really made them uh, mm. remarkably successful. They have huge wait lists, microscopic mm. dropout rates while preparing kids mm. for not just the traditional Vogue Tech areas, but life sciences and a variety of other uh, topics that, uh, that David can share with you. That's awesome. Oh, I'm already yeah, I, excited about learning about this. Yes, David, what are your thoughts? The 1993 Ed Reform Act was uh, the trigger that forced the change in vocational technical education. Uh, I'm certainly old enough to have experienced both ends of the spectrum mm -hmm. and uh, served in leadership capacities where I could impact at an individual school district mm -hmm. level. And the big challenge was to move to a 50-50 kind of instructional environment. Uh, previously, the emphasis was always on the occupational trades. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, in order for our students to be eligible to receive a certified high school diploma, 
uh, through MCAS, which is our state testing, uh, we had to provide more academic instruction. So we developed schedules that over the four years, the students spend four, uh, two years in their academic studies and two years in their vocational studies. Okay. We use the same academic frameworks, the standards, as any other high school would have to do academically so that the kids can be prepared and similarly tried not to um, reduce the skill levels upon graduation. And we were really successful at that by getting out of the idea is half of our teachers are vocational teachers and half are academic, but we're all vocational, technical, and academic teachers, meaning mm -hmm. that academic standards and skills were being taught in the vocational arena and the vocational arena was being used as an integrated way to show the academic skills that the students needed to be successful in life. So that ultimately, we call it a dual pathway. Mm -hmm. When I finish graduating from a regional voc tech in Massachusetts, I can go on to post-secondary education, or I can pursue the career pathway that I originally mm -hmm. Uh, selected as a ninth grader at the school. So, I, I, and then that would not have happened, in my opinion, unless we were forced to. And mm -hmm. we were forced to because, sure. quite frankly, we would not have survived if our kids weren't going to get a high school diploma. So, right. we were driven to it. Yes. Very good to understand. And just to go a little deeper, Jamie, if you would, on you know why there are such small dropout rates, I think that will be very interesting for parents, and the strong academic performance. Um, and I have to throw in, since of course we are watchdogs over woke curriculum that is so focused on culture rather than ac you know basic academics. I'm assuming you all have a pretty rigorous focus on basic academics. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on both of yeah, those that, things. So, I mean, if you had to kind of encapsulate what really has played K-12 education in this mm -hmm. country for the last 30, 40 years, is that it's kind of gone guardrail to guardrail on all these really uh, poor quality fads. I mean, we've seen it more recently with CRT and some other things, but you know, mm -hmm. this uh, really kind of soft skills, not very high academic quality uh, has, has really plagued uh, public education for a long time. And what what Massachusetts did with this high stakes test, and it's one of our only handful of states that actually has a high stakes test. So you have to pass uh, English and math and science uh, mm -hmm. tests to graduate from uh, from a high school in, in Massachusetts, including the Vogue Tech mm -hmm. schools, as, as David said. Uh, you know, but it's grounded in really high quality liberal arts that are classic literature, poetry and drama, really high quality uh, STEM standards. The, most of them were developed by uh, really high quality academic content experts. The, the previous math standards in Massachusetts, which elevated us and made us internationally competitive, were developed wow. by a Harvard mathematician. So awesome. it gives you the sense of the kind of quality. But I think the thing that I'm struck by is uh, why there's such microscopic dropout rates in these schools. These are very uh, school-based uh, schools. That, that is to say that the superintendent director, people like David and others, really have a lot of autonomy. The state mm -hmm. articulates the, the standards and the expectations, but it's really the goal of the school to figure out how to get there. And, and they're deeply connected with school choice. Of course, the parents driving the school choice, the kids not only picking what they're, where they're gonna go to school matters enormously, but what they're gonna study, what kind of discipline within the voc tech world is mm -hmm. also. And then of course, they have a lot of great connections with local businesses and communities. So there's mm -hmm. a variety of different factors that have gotten to the point where it's really, uh, all the decisions in the building, these buildings, and there's about uh, 40 or so of these schools across the state, they're made by people locally, whether it's the parents or whether it is the school officials. And I think that that local autonomy and ownership over the choice of where you're going to go and the work that's going to be done there, that, I think that's a real game changer. That's excellent. Yeah. Very I, interesting. I would add to that that uh, interest is a big piece of a student's success. And if some of the if students been in a traditional academic setting K through eight and has struggled and is disinterested as they enter into high school, there has to be a new way of providing instruction. And 
kinesthetic learning, which, which is a big part of what we do, is sparks some students, not all students, but sparks the students. And it's key that students choose to come to our school, not being told as they were years ago, that you're not college material, so mm. therefore you're gonna to go to the Vogue School. Mm. These are kids that are, uh, are bright, but most importantly, interested in this type of learning environment. And we use small learning communities in our vocational programs to ensure we're watching over their growth and development, mm. making sure they get the social services that they need in support of their education. And our mission is not to have any kid fail. It's to have every child graduate with a high school diploma and credentials to enter the world of work. So That's awesome. Uh, motivation and interest are key. That is so good. And I think you sort of answered the next question I was going to ask, which is how are you able to attract students with special needs or from low income backgrounds, um, which might also carry some, you know, emotional uh, circumstances for them to overcome. And I think you answered it partly anyway, when you said that you have uh, small groups, if you will, working groups within the school, you're, it sounds like you're able to structure things a little differently. Uh, that can meet the needs of all students. Um, yeah, if you want to go to the next level on that, I'd uh, love to again, get a better picture of what that looks like for these kids. Sure. I'll, I'll just kind of jump in quickly on that. So part of the kind of the great story here is not only that the performance has been outstanding, not only mm -hmm. that the uh, continued high quality occupational education is outstanding, that has, you know, been the, the model for other states. And I mean, the, the number of uh, students that have won, you know, Skills USA and a lot of these national contests is incredible. But the Vogue Tech schools in Massachusetts have done it with twice the number of special needs kids. Wow. Uh, and so the performance for these, these schools is right up there with the uh, average comprehensive high school in the state, which I think should really be kind of a uh, you know, it, it's a it's a just a great feature of this story. But I but I think it is because the curriculum and the work is really tailored to the needs of the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I often say that it's a it's a very child centered culture. Uh, I was working on this accountability agency and we did, you know, reviews of 100 school districts. We did a lot of reviews of Oak Tech schools and very quickly you just begin to make the connection here that this is it's a the, there's a a, a, a a comprehensive approach to mm -hmm. education here that I think particularly meets the needs of kids that have, have special needs and that's again it's mm -hmm. why that achievement is so remarkable because it they are bridging achie an achievement gap that people don't always think of as an immediate achievement gap but mm -hmm. it certainly is and it's it's because of the unique culture that they have in these schools. I love yeah. it. I think the fact it, it's a family environment. Mm -hmm. If you can recognize that if a student chooses to be a welder, that student has the same three welding instructors for four years, mm -hmm. and it becomes a little family. Yes. Uh, they're getting watched over constantly and mm -hmm. encouraged, and they know what they can and can't do, and discipline because of safety factors mm -hmm. is something they learn very quickly. And sure. we teach the work ethic of showing up to school every day, being prepared with a uniform and tools and being on time. Mm -hmm. And these are skills that you can't teach uh, other than by doing. Yes. And after four years, you know, you got to be to school on time. You got to be to work on time. You better be dressed, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So this practice uh, and being supervised very closely uh, and supported very closely, I think. That's key. great. That is so powerful. Would either of you like to share a story of a, of a student that's gone through the program that has gone on to uh, be successful in their career? I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give you one. So Pioneer does a lot of work on academic standards. We've done an enormous number of events with Pulitzer Prize winners on every major phase of American mm -hmm. history. Just a couple of years ago, we did an event uh, around World War II. It was picked up by C-SPAN. We did a, a student essay contest, and uh, I think we probably have about 100 applications of these uh, student essays written on historical topics. Well, the student that outperformed the highest performing charter schools in the country, the highest performing traditional public schools in the country, the Catholic schools, the Jewish day schools, a variety of different elite prep schools, 
was a kid from uh, of Oak Tech School. And so it, it, I think that's an incredible story wow. where you have a kid who is only spending half of her time in academics and is training for a, a career in vocational technical, but outperforms kids in wow. a really high quality choice options uh, in, in an academic area. That's fantastic. So final, oh yes, David, do you have a story? I was just going to say, it. I ran into a youngster who graduated about 15 years ago from the school where I was superintendent. And uh, he's a computer software engineer and started his career at Old Colony in, in uh, computer science. That was his major. Um, and is just thriving in that environment 15 years later. But it's also as important to think about the many electricians, plumbers, mm -hmm. HVAC people yes. who are not only working in the field, but now own their companies and are graduates of both tech schools. 75% of the electricians in the greater New Bedford area, which is on the south coast of Massachusetts, are graduates of greater New Bedford Boat Tech. So they're employing other graduates. And Wonderful. You know, it, it, it is a good life. You can make a wonderful career yes. in, family, in the trades just like you can as a college graduate. Absolutely. And sometimes it will spare you from uh, the woke culture and revisionist and, and history that, in the college at the college level. So it's a great option. And speaking of that, I'm sure there will be parents listening that are listening right now that are wondering, is there one in my state or how can I um, help be on a team or a committee to start one of these schools in my state? I'm assuming there have to be some choice laws in place, et cetera. But how, is, how does that work? Yeah, it's a great question. So one of the things that we're really happy about this book is, is that we're not only trying to remind people here in Massachusetts of how we got to be number one in the country and internationally competitive, why it is that we've got such great folk tech schools, but we're really trying to work hard to export the lessons. Again, every state is going to have to find their way, but we've been working with about 12 states or so in the last several months since we rolled out the book and a toolkit that, that David uh, uh, co-authored too. So he's been doing an enormous number of media appearances and other appearances in, oh, Texas, Oklahoma, Florida, um, mm -hmm. South Dakota, uh, you know, state of Washington, a handful of others. He, he can talk about those, but that's what we're really trying to do awesome. is, to, is to export some of the key lessons so that state legislators, board of education members, parents in other states can learn some of these lessons and help replicate them. I love it. So you would be all right with us sharing your toolkit to our resources oh, for absolutely. parents to review. Wonderful. Well, yeah. we will be thrilled to do that. Well, it's been wonderful talking with you all today. Do you have any uh, closing comments for us? No, again, we're just really grateful. I mean, there's a, you know, Pioneer pushes for a wide variety of school choice options. This is a fantastic story. I mean, we're really proud of the work that these educators mm -hmm. and these parents and these students have accomplished here in Massachusetts. And that's why we're so thrilled that uh, the co-authors of this book, including David, worked so hard to prepare it and that it's getting such wide traction across the country. And I'm, again, really great to, grateful to you, Tamara, and FreedomWorks for all the excellent work that you folks do uh, to keep pushing these conversations. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. We are all about parental rights in education, and of course, parental rights also hinge on parental choice. Uh, nobody knows our kids as well as we do. And they have one childhood. Um, and so it's a great time for you moms and dads to be bold and to be strong and look at these alternatives. What is best for your child? We did that in our home. Our kids are 29 and 33 now. We made various uh, school choice decisions through the years. Not too often, but here and there, we knew it. Change was needed. So don't be afraid to go down that road um, and help your kids and stand up for your rights for choice in education. And Votech is an awesome choice. Thank you so much for being with me today, David and Jamie. Thanks. Appreciate it.